Hello, my name is Father Boniface. I'm a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent d'Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and so grateful to have this chance to talk to Father Levi Hartle, priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, as we explore the way that the Holy Spirit's been at work in his life, and he shares his journey of faith. Father Levi, it's wonderful to be with you. Awesome, Father Boniface. It's wonderful to be with you as well. Before we get into your story, let's turn to Our Lady for a moment and ask for her to pray for us so that we can focus on the things the Lord wants us to focus on and to pray also for our listeners that they can hear what the Lord wants to say to them. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, Father Levi, I've known you for a few years, so some of your story I know, and I'm delighted to share you with our listeners, many of whom are also in the Pittsburgh area and may know you to some degree, but we're going to go a little deeper into your story. But before we get into that, if you could just give us a little picture of yourself, uh, how old you are, when you were ordained, uh, a little about where you grew up, and just to give us a sense of, uh, of who you are. Sure. So I'm, I'm 36 now. I was ordained in 2015. So I'm coming up on my seven year anniversary here. I grew up in Saxonburg area, South, South Butler. And yeah, that pretty much covers the basics. I think. <laughs> and you grew up in a, in a Catholic family. I did. So my, both of my parents were Catholic growing up and then they both kind of just fell away from the church. And then my dad's older brother went to, I guess he, he was with a non-denominational person who, you know, he was saved and, um, there was this great joy that he had in his life. And so he brought that to his siblings. And, um, so a lot of my dad's family, which grew up Catholic, ended up joining other churches, but all of them encountering and knowing Jesus. And then that kind of reset this fire in my dad's heart. And so my dad said to my mom, you know, we need, we need to be going to church. So they went to a, um, basically a, a Pentecostal church for a couple of years. And then, um, God spoke audibly to my dad and said, go to St. Joseph's church, which was, uh, he didn't know what, what St. Joseph's church was, but he looked it up and it was only 15 minutes from their house. So he got there and said, you know, I, um, I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I've received Holy Eucharist. Like I, I, uh, done everything Catholic, but uh, I'm currently going to this other church. Like, is it okay if I come here? And the pastor said, do you believe the creed? Do you believe everything? Like, do you believe what we believe? And he said, yes. And he said, then as far as I can tell, you're Catholic. So he said, yes, you can, you can worship here, you know? So he started attending mass there. And after a couple of years, the family transitioned at the St. Joseph's church in Cabot. Wow. A voice spoke audibly to your dad? Yeah, he's had that, I think, twice in his life. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Wow. And, and to go to the Catholic Church. So beautiful the way the, and I think that's uh, this, this kind of uh, connection of the, the work of the Lord in the evangelical, Pentecostal world, but then really driving into the heart of the faith in the Catholic Church. This is kind of a, an ongoing theme of what I know of you and know of your family, so I'm sure we'll, we'll revisit that. But, so tell me about your, your faith growing up. Uh, did, you, did, the, did the whole family um, stay pretty united in faith, and what was your experience about that? Yeah, it's a good, you know, it's funny as you, as you mentioned that. My, my mom was a little slower to come along, but it was really beautiful. My dad was like, I know this is what God said. He told me, you know, and I will be doing this. And so as kind of as he began to go to St. Joe's, she ended up finding a, there was a charismatic prayer group there. And she really identified, you know, with the, the people that were there and was able to become a part of that larger community. So for us growing up, we were all baptized at the same time on the Feast of Christ the King. I was two. My brother Steve was four. So we're going from youngest to oldest. I'm the youngest. I was two. Steve was four. Alicia was six. And my oldest brother, Jason, was eight when we all got baptized at the same time. Um, so that was pretty wild. Wow. And That's then, pretty amazing. 
<laughs> yeah, it's pretty it's pretty crazy how uh, how the Lord works. But our home life, you know, my mom really she just fell in love with praising Jesus, praising him and his presence, you know, being in his presence, the man, different manifestations of the Lord's goodness, you know, so she we had we were homeschooled from first to fifth grade everyone but Jason. Jason in fourth grade was ready to go. So he, he went to uh, St. Mary's in Herman. And then the rest of us were going, as we went through homeschool, my, my mom would always start the day with Bible study, which was really a time of praise. We would always start with singing songs, probably 15 minutes or so to a half hour of just singing and praising God. And and we would have have the Bible story. She had big Bible cards, like uh, key cards, and so we were very rooted and grounded in praise and the scriptures. Yeah, that was that was like the core thing because that was my mother's heart, basically. Hmm. Beautiful. You picked that up from her. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad. I mean, my dad has a heart of praise as well. It's just that he wasn't homeschooling us. So, <laughs> you know, so he definitely, we definitely got it from him too. My dad's the kind of guy that he wears his heart on his sleeve. You know, he's, he's deeply loving and just pours himself out and in, in service and love and things. And so you, he also really taught us to praise and to not be afraid, you know, to be ourselves and to let our hearts pour out to God. So that was pretty awesome to you. Wow. That's amazing. So was it all really natural for you throughout? Uh, you had such positive examples, such beautiful formation. Uh, was there was there a point that all of that became kind of especially real for you or that you, you made a, a personal step in faith? Yeah, definitely. I would say I. it's funny because as much as we had this culture of prayer and praise and Jesus, you know, in our house, and we tried to live the scriptures. I can vividly remember when I was 16, I was praising the Lord. So we had gone to Steubenville for, a, for a, a weekend retreat. And when we came back, we asked our pastor if we could start doing praise and worship stuff at the masses. And he, he said we could. So, so we did. And one day I was just, we were just practicing, you know, just praising God in the church. And I was 16 and I just remember I was singing some song to Jesus, you know, how I love Jesus, something, something about loving Jesus. And it just, it was like this infused grace. It just hit me. Everything is real. I was like, whoa, wait a second. All of this is real. I really do love Jesus. It was like, not just I love Jesus, but I'm in love with Jesus. Like I, I'm in love with God. It was just like my whole my whole world just opened up, you know, and I was just like, whoa, I felt like I was seeing for the first time, you know, and I was like, we've been kind of doing all this stuff, but I feel like I get it uh, for the first time. Like this, these love songs I'm singing to God are real, you know? Mm, beautiful. Wow. It sounds like a, uh... One of St. Ignatius's signs of spiritual consolation, our heart inflamed with love, lifted up above all creatures before standing before our, our Creator and Lord. You were really transformed by that. Yeah, for sure. And did that lead to a, a change in you in some way, or did that have a lasting impact? It definitely did. You know, it's interesting. So I was... 16 when that happened my whole life has kind of been marked by that i guess when i was like six years old i was singing in church and i always have been singing so my life has always been about just praising jesus but when i was in seventh and eighth grade you know some of my teachers asked me if i had been called thought that i might be called to the priesthood and my response was, no, I haven't thought about that. It was a little odd to me, though, because one of my teachers from St. Mary's and Herman had asked me, and then one of the ladies at church from St. Joe's had asked me, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. They don't know each other. You know, why would two different people in two different places be asking me if I've ever thought about being a priest? 
So in eighth grade, I really started asking the question. And some of my dad's brothers had gone to seminary at St. Fidelis when they were in high school. So I was like, oh, geez, I better know soon. You know, because I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm in eighth grade and geez, they went in high school. So I guess I should know by next year. So I started praying really hard. And at that point, I don't know that I'd ever really heard God's voice. So this is two years before that 16 year old experience of praise happened. And I was just a little bit um, unnerved trying to figure it out and praying really hard and okay, God, do you want me to do this or not? And then I talked to my cousin, Garrett Hartle, uh, who isn't Catholic, but he's a good Christian man. And he said, you know, if God wants you to be a priest, he'll make it clear. So don't stress yourself out. So I didn't exactly take that the best way. I, I was kind of like, well, okay. Like, I'll just do whatever I want, and God will kind of hit me over the head with a two-by-four if he wants me to do it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, that probably wasn't, not that it wasn't the best advice, but it was, I didn't take it the best way. I probably should have followed up with someone, but I just kind of dropped it and was like, okay, God will make it clear. So there were the, there was that kind of in the back of my heart, in the back of my mind of, okay, what's what's God calling me to? So I would say in high school, I was asking that question and there was one lady I kind of fell in love with. And so my heart was a little bit there and a little bit with, am I supposed to be a priest? And when this happened, when I was 16, it opened up a new depth of love for God that I wanted to, I wanted to do whatever he wanted me to do. You know, I wanted to serve him. I wanted to love him, but I wasn't exactly sure what that looked like. Um, So I, I looked into getting into college to study voice because I wanted to learn how to actually sing for the Lord's glory. And so that was my plan. I applied to Grove City College. My sister Alicia had gone to Grove City College. Uh, she's four years older than me. And so I looked up to her and I, I'd go up and hang out with her sometimes and be like, this place is so awesome. So I went up and tried out there and the voice teacher was like, yeah, it's obvious that you've never studied voice a day in your life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. Thank and you. he said, it's also <laughs> obvious that you have a nice natural voice, so I can work with you. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. So then I get accepted to Grove City. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to learn how to sing and praise the Lord. Because I was really, again, I, I think that it wasn't just that experience. Like I said, my I kind of inherited this desire to praise Jesus from my mom and my dad. But then uh, as I was all ready to go and, okay, I'm going to go spend my life like learning how to praise God and we'll see what happens there. I went on this retreat with my friend Peter Brosnitz from grade school. We were grade school friends and best friends in high school. And so he said, hey, I'm going on this retreat at St. Paul of the Cross on the south side. Would you come down with me? I was like, yeah, of course. So I went down and it was the first night I got there and I had prayed, you know, for some sign a number of times throughout my high school years. You know, God, if you really want me to be a priest, like give me some sign, right? But I I wasn't really thinking about that at all at this point. So I walk into St. Paul's, I have my, you know, my bags, I put my bags away. And even as I, I just put my bags down, I come out of my room and this random guy I'd never met before. Uh, he called himself Ron the Fireman. And a lot of people around the South Side know Ron. Um, and uh, But Ron, he had this prophetic ministry. He came right up to me. He said, Levi. And I'm thinking, okay, first of all, I don't know you. So how do you know my name? And then he began to share this word of knowledge. Like he he began to talk about my childhood and things that I could barely remember myself. And he's describing these this situation in my child. I'm thinking, I can I remember that, but it's so vague. How do you know this? You know, and as as I was looking at him and he was looking at me, like he was looking very much like right into my eyes, you know, and I was like, okay, this is getting a little weird. So I'm like, okay, this is either God or Satan or something, because this guy shouldn't know all this stuff. You know, like he it's impossible. there's no way he would know this stuff. And then as he finished this word. He said, you know, God's calling you to the priesthood. Hmm. And as he said that, I just felt this overwhelming sense of love and of peace and of joy. And I was like, whoa, 
okay, I don't think that was Satan. I think that was the Lord, you know, and it just, it just really overcame me. So I was just like, okay, I, I was pretty speechless at that point. And I just kind of waddled over to my room and sat down on my bed and I felt like God, the father was just holding me in his arms, you know, and I was like, wow. Okay. Mm. You know, father, like if this is what you made me for, then my answer is yes. You know, if you're calling me, then you know, I'll be a priest. I don't, I have no idea what that practically means, but yes. Wow. That is so beautiful. And I, I love, uh, how you share, Father Levi, the conjunction of that, that spiritual grace, feeling so overwhelmed with that sense of love, feeling held by the Father, and then healing the, hearing those words about God calling you to the priesthood. And uh, you're right, those, uh, those kinds of feelings don't come from the enemy. <laughs> and the, uh, being, being lifted up and held in the Father's arms is... Uh, not something that the enemy is capable of uh, of mocking or mimicking, and so uh, to hear those words at the same time, and and so beautiful to see, you know, sometimes we have I think there's a fear even of uh, God sort of uh, pigeonholing us or forcing us down a path or this this kind of heavy handedness, but but to the contrary, when His grace is at work, it opens up our freedom to be able to say mm. yes to him. It opens up our freedom to be able to give a more generous gift of ourselves than we might otherwise be capable of or interested in. Uh, it, it opens our heart to say yes more wholeheartedly rather than being a kind of constricting or oppressive feeling, which is more likely to come from the enemy. So what a beautiful description of that, of that grace. And, and your, I love I don't know what that means practically, but the answer is yes. That's so great. So honest. Very beautiful. So that was a critical moment. And that obviously has uh, stayed with you. Did, did, was that sort of sustained throughout the retreat too? You know, it's, you know, when you have powerful moments of grace you can always go back and like enter into them again and fresh grace flows from them as ignatius talks about like points of repetition i honestly don't remember much of any of the rest of the retreat uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but that part i'll never forget wow that's amazing and were you homeschooled through high school no i was so i got a little bit of everything i was homeschooled from first to fourth grade and then I went to St. Mary's in Herman from fifth to eighth grade. And then I went to Knock High School. And then I went to Grove City College, which is a conservative <laughs> uh, Protestant school. Wow. And then I, I went to seminary for years. And so I got the whole back to uh, some Catholic theology. And, you know, so, yeah, the whole spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Homeschool, Catholic school. Public school, Protestant school, seminary, excellent. That's amazing. So, what how, what unfolded from there? Did you, uh, you get in touch with the vocation director? Did you tell somebody about that first of all? Did you? How did that grace develop in your in your life? You know, it's funny. No one ever asked me that. I didn't tell a. I kind of had my plan. So, so I was sitting on my bed and I said, "Father, like, if I just got into Grove City College." It was extremely unlikely that I would get into Grove City College because my sister had like 4.0, you know, whatever. My grades weren't exactly hers. And I think I got into Grove City because I got into the music program. I got into the music program because Dr. Brown was a very gracious man. So I'm thinking like, Lord, you got me into Grove City. So is it okay if I go there? first and like learn how to praise you, learn how to worship you and use this voice. And then I can be a priest to do that. Um, and I just had a piece about that. So I was like, okay, all right. So I'll go to Grove City first and then I'll become a priest, you know? <laughs> so that was my plan. And so I didn't really talk to anybody. I, I mean, I told everybody about it after that. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a priest, you know? And I was just so sure in my heart that that is what God called me to. And I accepted that. So I went off to Grove City planning on 
learning how to worship and just learning how to, especially to use my voice and to lead others into worship through praise and through worship stuff. And then, and then to understand the scriptures more and through fellowship, getting to know there was Grove City is just wonderful with their fellowship. I really, I had, there was so much joy and so much life with their Bible studies and getting to know the guys and walking with them. Grove City is split up. So it's all guys on one side, all, all ladies on the other side. So all guy dorms. So you'd run through the dorm and be like football and guys would all run out and go play football. You know, <laughs> So I had, I had a blast uh, at Grove City and I learned so much. Yeah, it was beautiful. I study music education. So I, I do love teaching people and understanding how people work, you know, and how to, to bring something to them. It's always been a joy for me. I guess another dimension of my spiritual life, which is a huge dimension of it, is I, I'm created to build community through charity. So I guess all priests are, or all people are, but um, uh, you're familiar, Father Boniface, with you know the human formation coalition stuff and the um, Strengths Finder and MCOR and APES, but for me, that put words to, I guess, what I had been doing for a lot of my life as far as building up communities, you know, being a part of a, a group of people, not just in like a kind of shallow way, but more so in kind of the synod on synodality way of, of entering into intimacy with others in Christ, you know, sharing our hearts. Like at Grove City College, we would say, what's Jesus teaching you? Right. And the person would share, Oh, this is what I've been experiencing in prayer. You know, God's been teaching me this. It's another way of saying like, what's life teaching you quote unquote, but it's specifically saying, what is God teaching you and what are you learning from him? And at Grove City, everyone was very open and sharing and doing. And so I learned uh, all the more to share my faith and to live the scriptures. Yeah. I might be going on a tangent there, but my favorite you know, one of our first Bible studies was uh, to do everything without complaining or arguing. So it's to become blameless and pure children of God from Philippians. And I just remember thinking like, this was the first time as an adult, I'm living the scriptures. Mm. And I was like, wait a second. My parents always taught us to live the scriptures. But this was the time that I was saying, no, I'm going to live the scripture. Like I am going to work with all my heart to live this reality, not just to hear about it, not just to talk about it. I want to live to not complain or argue to become a blameless and pure child of God. So all the guys on our, our hall that did the Bible study, we would keep each other accountable to that. And we, if someone came back from a hard test or something, we'd be like, Oh, you're not complaining. Are you, you know, like, Oh yeah, never mind. Ha ha. I'm, <laughs> I'm good. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of another aspect of, what began to grow, especially at Grove City College. That's beautiful. I love that. Uh, it seems like there's always a, a dimension in the lives of the saints that goes back to taking particular passages, kind of taking God at his word, you know, without without a, a kind of fundamentalism. There's there's an intuition and the Lord works through it. I, I think of Mother Teresa with... Matthew chapter 25, whatever you did to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. And that refrain was so powerful in her life. Or mm. uh, St. Therese with, uh, unless you become like this child, or or my vocation is love, drawing from 1 Corinthians 13. It's like there are per particular passages that, that r rise up and are just radicalized in a certain way in the life of a disciple or obviously a, a St. Anthony of the desert who heard, if you wish to be perfect, then sell everything and give to the poor and come follow me. And he had a particular movement from that to the desert, to monasticism. St. Francis heard the same word among others and, uh, and, and followed Jesus in a different way. But anyway, I think it's uh, beautiful. You experience that, that scripture as a, uh, as a guiding light for you and we're and really learn to take that in a more uh, more bold way and have the, the support of Christian brothers in community to help you with that when you talk about growing in community through charity uh, I, you mentioned the 
those different human formation assessments. Are you, are you referring to having a number of relationship building strengths? Yeah. So there's relationship building strengths. There's also like I'm number one strategic, but my strategic, as I'm sure as you've coached many people, um, all of our strengths are geared toward what the other strengths have there, you know, so through there's a number of relationship building, even with influencing like high communication and high um, woo. It's like I, I want to know everybody and I want to communicate a vision of charity, you know, and how, hey, everyone, let's get together and love each other. Like, let's be the body of Christ, right? It's you're talking about like the, um, you know, the scriptural the scriptures that kind of root our life. And for me, it's John, John 17, you know, may they be one as we are one. And to know that the father loves us as he loves his son, that the same love is coming to us and that we are to be one in him as the, you know, the second Vatican council says that we are to be an extension of the divine life into the world. To me, that just, it's just, I'm speechless. You know, when I read that, I was just like, are you serious? Like, we get to do that? <laughs> this is who we are? Yeah, my my strengths are very much like to strategically build up a community. So I'm, to I guess, a more broad vision that would help would be I'm an apostolic shepherd or a, kind of a double shepherd apostolic. Um, so I just love, I love serving people and loving people. And I also, my apostolic side likes to, to build up new communities, see how a new community can be built a new, um, whether it's a community or a ministry or things. So if I'm asked to do something like, Hey, can you lead the, the youth ministry? You know, I was asked to do at the parish. So my number one thing is not to start doing stuff. It's to look around and say, who here is passionate about youth ministry and to bring them together and then to build them into a team and then to, lead that team into the work. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. And I and I love the witness of your human strengths. I mean, those are those are things that go far back in your life, but the way that they are directed when the the grace of God is infused through that. So not just communication, but communicating the love of God, not just getting to know people, but getting to know people for the sake of sharing Christ and discovering Christ in them, not just strategy on how to build a better business, but a strategy on how to build a, a more loving bonded community. And uh, beautiful to see the way that those, those uh, natural human gifts, strengths have been shaped in that way. And then that apostolic shepherding quality. It's such an interesting combination, right? We, we think of those as being almost opposites, the one who takes care of the flock is not the one who leaves the flock to go find the lost one. <laughs> but you do both, like our Lord. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, it's true. I do find myself a little bit pulled in many directions sometimes because I, my shepherd wants to continue to walk with and guide and lead. And, and my apostolics always... I'm excited to do that, but I'm always also, like you say, looking to build up that next community, that next, like, what else is God calling me to, you know? <laughs> That's beautiful. It's a nice problem to have. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about uh, how your how your story is developed. You know, maybe a, a little bit if there there are any uh, kind of keynotes in seminary or, or even uh, as you were discovering this? I mean, I think, I think in your priestly ministry, there also have been some, um, some twists and turns, some points of self-knowledge and points of discovery, and certainly God's hand at work through the, uh, the, the voice of the bishop. And uh, tell us how things, how things developed for you. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, when I, um, well, I was a little bit, it was tough. Seminary was tough for me because I, I came from a very open, kind of loving space at Grove City. And, you know, seminary is a beautiful place, but um, it can be, when you get there, everyone's kind of like, where am I and what am I doing? And it takes a little while to kind of get your bearings. And 
Um, when I would want to share like, oh, this is what Jesus is doing. People would say, well, you can tell your spiritual director, you know, I was like, what do you mean? Tell my spiritual director, like you're my brother, you know? So there was just a different culture there that wasn't quite the culture that I had come from. So it, that was difficult for me for sure. And the Lord kind of, kind of stripped everything away from me this first six months. I would say it was extremely painful. One of the most painful times in my life that first year. But it was really beautiful because it was a very desert experience. And I found myself just coming to the Lord and coming to the Lord. So when I was in college, I wanted to do a lot of praise and worship. But I found also there was kind of this emotional ism that I added to it. So I was kind of seeking this emotional high of experiencing Jesus. And eventually I, I started to say, well, wait a second. Why are we always singing to him, but we're never listening to him? And so there was a little group of us that tried to start like a listening group, but there was no context or there was no really... There weren't a lot of spiritual fathers there to father us. So I had tons of spiritual brothers, but not too many spiritual fathers. So in seminary, I gained a ton of spiritual fathers. And I also gained this constant access to the Blessed Sacrament um, because we have a chapel in the house. So I would just spend a lot of time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And I, I began to experience just beautiful consolations and Six months into our experience of seminary, that was it was rough. We had a beautiful retreat with Father Bob McCreary. And Father Bob said, you know, if you're not making a holy hour every day, it's not that you're going to struggle as a priest. You're simply going to fail. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my. You know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, and everything Father Bob had said to that point was just like, it was just like scriptures or church fathers. Like it was just pure truth coming out of his mouth. So I'm like, I got to believe this guy. So the next day I started making a holy hour. I had no clue what I was doing, but I figured I'm sitting here for an hour with Jesus. And then thank God. Um, shortly after that, I met father Lester Knoll. I, um, we had gone to lunch one day and I was just really struggling with things and, so we went to lunch and he basically sat there and read my heart and like told me everything that I was suffering without me telling him anything. And I was like, how do you know all that? You know, and um, I said, wow, um, well, maybe you could be my like a spiritual director to me. Um, and at the time, you know, he wasn't he wasn't on the book. So he said, well, I can't be your spiritual director, but I could we can meet as friends and just talk. And I'm sure I could help you out here and there. So. Honestly, that um, I sometimes I talk about it like Father Lester plucked me out of darkness. You know, it was just like I um, it was a time of just great turmoil and uncertainty. You know, it was going on and just a lot of pain in my heart. And Father Lester really helped me to receive peace and joy and love in the midst of so many like everything else being stripped away. The Lord was intensely loving me in my holy hours. And I was feeling like my heart was on fire. My head was on fire. And sometimes I remember just like feeling like I was so on fire, like I, like it almost hurt. You know, I was like, God, just stop. Like, it's enough. Like, I can't, I can't take anymore. Um, but it was just a really intense loving coming from God. And of course, I was crying out to be intensely loved, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> But he was deeply responding to it, but I didn't understand it. Like, I didn't understand what was going on until Father Lester began to explain it to me. And that was so life-giving and just so, yeah, it was just so beautiful. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, I'm starting to see what's going on. But there was a lot of, um, I, I entered with a great freedom and that wasn't super accepted, you know, necessarily by all the other brothers. Some of them were, were very accepting, but some of them not so much. So I, I'm i a very gentle person, and that was very difficult for me. So I, I kind of like faded into my shell a little bit. But inside that shell, the Lord was was really transforming me. So yeah, I would say my first year of seminary was extremely painful, but extremely beautiful. Just a huge depth of growth. And after that, was it after that? No. So then I had another 
year there, which was much better and things started to fall into play better emotionally for me, I should say things started to fall into place. But then, um, after that year, Father Lester had asked me to do a 40 day silent retreat with Father Sylvan Rouse, who was an, you know, Father Sylvan, an incredible passionist yes. monk, uh, in Bedford. So that was amazing. So I, I had never done a silent retreat before, but I'm a pretty rambunctious fella. And, uh, I, by rambunctious, I mean like maybe a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to like trying to live life well. So I was dr like driving and driving and driving and like, tr how can I be holy? How can I be holy? Right. So of course, a lot of young people build their own kingdoms that way. But, um, but Father Lester was guiding me and said, you need to spend some time with Father Sylvan. So going to the, to the 40 day retreat after minor seminary was a life changing experience and really mm. laid a new foundation for my spiritual life. I would say before that, you know, when I would go to Steubenville or I'd go to other retreats, there was a lot of like God was there and the people were there, but there was such a mix of people and God that you, you leave retreat and you're like, where's my retreat high? It's all gone. You know, and it's like, oh, now I have to go back to reality. But on the 40 day, you enter so much into reality that, that it's not like, oh, well, back to reality. It's like, what is this? You know, <laughs> coming, coming out of the 40 days of silence and into, I kind of went right into the fast pace of theology and it was a little bit crazy, but, um, but what was established in my time on my 40 day, it just is, you know, my experience of God that is, uh, was just so profound. Mm. Nothing could ever take that away from mm. me, you know, that's. Yeah. I had uh, forgotten that you made that 40 day retreat. Although I feel silly saying that because at the same time I quote you, uh, every year to, my seminary and formation class, you had asked a question of Father Sylvan, what are, what things would you teach people in a parish? Something like that. And he said something like, God's presence in action in secondary causality and the indwelling presence. If you cover those, that's probably good, you know, good enough. And uh, so I always teach the seminarians that I say, well, if this is the thing that Father Sylvan says, every Catholic should understand, then at least you should understand it. So we're going to go through this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. He told me those are the two secrets to life. I'm like, all right. OK. I, and I've tried <laughs> to live by those two secrets because he was 90 and he was extremely holy. So I figured he knows what the secrets to life are. <laughs> yeah, what a grace. And when you said 40-day retreat, you meant 40 days. A lot of people are familiar with 30-day Ignatian retreats, but this is a 40-day Passionist retreat modeled after St. Paul of the Cross's initial retreat before founding the order and, uh, and a beautiful, beautiful experience with those holy men in Bedford who have all gone to the Lord now. May they rest in peace, but they really sowed incredible seeds of of grace and love broadly and, and certainly in your soul and, and uh, in many ways in my soul. Father Tom and I dedicated our spiritual direction book to Father Sylvan. And, mm. uh, and your beautiful experience with Father Lester as a spiritual director highlights uh, a dimension of spiritual direction that is, uh, that's so crucial when people are growing in, uh, in intense ways. Uh, so especially when we're running into the nights when we're running into those times, places of purification in our souls that can get really confusing to do on our own. And, and in fact, one of the problems that we might, that God may be purifying in those nights is precisely the fact that we do it on our own. <laughs> it's uh, one mm. of those paradoxical things that you can't overcome self-sufficiency by yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, especially in that space, spiritual direction is one of the, the ways that God helps us to navigate the darkness, navigate the intensity of, of his love, navigate the, the meandering paths of our own hearts. And uh, what a beautiful witness of spiritual direction in your experience with Father Lester. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he's... And I've was ever since... So that was 2008... 2009, I guess I, or halfway through 2008, that I started meeting with him. And, 
and when I was in theology in Washington, I didn't, I, I went to the directors there, but I would always over the summers, you know, come back up and be reconnect with him. And I, I found, you know, I don't know how much I want to say, but uh, <laughs> I, I found that Father Lester and I have like many, many of the same gifts, but he has 50 years of using them that I don't have. <laughs> right. <laughs> Makes a difference. And I was like, whoa. So everything, everything I would say I experienced, he'd say, yeah, I know that. Like this, it goes like this and that means this. And, it, and I'm like, oh, perfect. You know, when I would share that with any of my other directors, they were just like, I don't really know what you're talking about. Or I see an aspect of that, but like, I don't, I haven't felt exactly what you're feeling right now. You know what I mean? So it was like, there was a, I, I always, I think, you know, when people are looking for spiritual directors, it's important that we're the same on a sense of like personality wise, like that our personalities match, but also like our spiritual experience and realities also need to match in a certain sense, I think. And it, Father Lester has just been such a gift for me because, yeah, he just understands, like he just gets it, you know, on on every spiritual level that, that I've experienced. He's always already walked that path and said, yep, I've walked that path. It leads here. And even when I think he's wrong or when I'm in my arrogance a couple of years ago, it's like, oh, I think I know more than he does now, you know, or like, I think, and then it's just like a teenager or 20 year old who thinks they know more than their dad, you know? And then you're like, oh, never mind, uh, you know, and you just you realize, nope, he's he always ends up being right, you know, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just it's just been beautiful. So I've had for like 15 years now I've walked with him and it's been a real gift. Mm. Praise God. That's beautiful. And. We have a, a a few minutes left. I want to give you some space to to talk about how how the Lord continued working in your life. Uh, if there are any other um, moments there from seminary or or how things have developed since you were ordained a priest, any uh, any insights? I also always like to ask about how you've seen your prayer grow, and you've you've given us some beautiful moments already, and uh, and maybe that's as much as needs to be said describing that movement from, well, uh, I suppose nothing to praise to uh, that listening, uh, really walking some of the darkness and suffering, uh, staying close to Jesus in, in the midst of that. And But anyway, uh, any any other paths of the Holy Spirit's work in guiding you or, or some of those interior paths that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, so after the after the 40 day where I, I, I kind of experienced that, you know, the depth of my depravity, you might say on that 30 day and one of my, in an image, in a prayer image that I, that I won't describe for you. But as I, as I entered into this great suffering and seeing my own weakness as a human being and the evil inside my heart, as one spiritual writer said, you know, anyone who's serious about the spiritual life will eventually ask themselves, am I more evil or more good? Right. And then they'll notice, oh, Jesus is at the center of my being. So I must be ultimately good in there. But, um, but in that encounter, you know, it was, I kind of was freaked out by it. You know, God was very present, but I just wasn't aware that I was capable of sin in such a way, you know, so I said, oh my. So I kind of, you know, I think most of us do this without realizing we're doing it, but there's like the good me and the not so good me and we kind of bifurcate the sides of us. So I I had really tried to be the good me and pretend like the bad me didn't exist. No, 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 I don't sin. I'm perfect, right? And so I went on pastoral year. It was really beautiful. I was at St. Mary's in Glenshaw and I loved it. And I just really fell in love with the people of God. And I said, this is so wonderful. But I was just like, God, I don't think I'm I'm worthy of serving these people, of being a priest and doing this stuff. So then I went to the Institute of Priestly Formation uh, that following summer in, in IPF, the IPF in Omaha, Nebraska. And it was so powerful. I did an eight-day Ignatian retreat. And I was used to mostly apathetic prayer, you know, just sitting and being with Jesus and resting in his love. And that was pretty much 
um, what Father Lester had taught me. And then he would say like the grace is not in the details. Like don't worry about the details. Just look at Jesus and love him. Let him love you, right? So then my director at IPF said, you know, the grace is in the details. And I'm like, what? That's not true. <laughs> so, so I called Father Lester. I'm like, what this guy is telling me the opposite? He said, well, he's your director right now. So listen to him. So I did. And then I realized, oh, you know, the Ignatian way is seeing as we're looking at God and then God is looking at us. We're seeing ourselves from God's perspective. And I really hadn't done a whole lot of looking at myself. I had just done mostly looking at God and ignoring myself. So during the eight day retreat, that was a really powerful time where Jesus revealed his love for me. And there's one one really beautiful moment. I was meditating on the Last Supper and um, it said, you know, Jesus looked at them. And as I meditated on that, I saw in my uh, contemplative prayer, you know, you kind of imagine the scene, but then Jesus actually starts moving in the scene and he looked at me and I was like, ah, he really sees me, you know? And I thought, well, maybe he sees like the fun, loving Frisbee playing music, Levi. And then he just like shattered that mask and his gaze was just coming right into me. And I'm like, ah, then I'm like, oh no, he sees the sinner. I'm a sinner, you know? And then he just shattered that mask. And then I was like, what else is there? And I didn't know there was anything deeper than those two things until his gaze landed on me. And I was just like, whoa, there's someone back here. And that was really, yeah, that was the start of something really beautiful, discovering my actual self. And that whole week, there was a lot of crying almost every Every day I would go to spiritual direction. I was just weeping and, and figuring out that God actually loved me and that I'm actually worth loving. And um, that was a really, really uh, powerful eight-day retreat. And then the whole IPF experience really unraveled that, uh, integrated it into into my life. So that was truly amazing. And I, I fell in love with the Ignatian way. So the following year, I did a 30-day Ignatian retreat um, in Denver with some Jesuits down there. And that was amazing. And that was just like a, that was just so much joy. That was like a time of, of just love, you know. It was just a beautiful time. And that was right before my diaconate ordination. And I think one of my priest priest advisors at TC had said, you know, diaconate's like the marriage day because from that day forward, you, you belong to the church and she belongs to you. You take your place in the sanctuary after you're ordained. And so I was really looking at that, like that's, this is my wedding day, you know? Mm. And, um, it was really, really powerful. Um, even candidacy was like the church is proposing to me, like she wants mm. to nice. walk with me and me to walk with her for the rest of my life. So I was just, it, it was just sheer joy, my diaconate, entering into that that marriage. And it was so wonderful all year. And then I became a priest and I was like, well, this is so intense. Because you like you get married and then you have millions of children next year, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> so that whole, yeah, it gets more and more wild, I guess, just... I got to St. Killian's with Father Bober and, you know, they hand you the keys to this huge building and all these people are like, hi, Father, and just totally trust you with their life. And you're like, whoa, okay. Like my relationship with God is different. My relationship to myself is different. My relationship to everyone else in the world is different. This is going to be a learning curve, you know? Wow. That is the truth. You described it beautifully. It's a big, a big shift. Well, Father Levi, we are coming to the end of our time. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you share so beautifully uh, the movements of the interior life and really give us a, a sense for what that looks like. I know there are so many points for our, our listeners to, to take home for their own application, but, but above all, simply to praise God for what he's done in your life and uh, the way that he's called you and the way that you've been able to respond and 
and just the the overflow of grace. I know so many people are, have been affected by your living out of uh, of the sacrament of priesthood. So, thank you so much for all of that. And as we uh, wrap up the program, could you offer a prayer and give us a blessing? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for making us in your image and likeness. For how you delight in us, for how you call us sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you for calling us to oneness with you. And we thank you for bringing us into divine life. Thank you, Lord, for the sacraments. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you for these movements of your spirit that transform us. And Lord, we just pray that you would pour out your spirit upon your beloved people, that you would strengthen and bless and guide and lead them. Lord, that they would find the love that you so desire them to find, the love that is always present. We pray Lord, for wisdom and understanding that they might see it and embrace it and walk in it. That their hearts would be constantly filled with praise. May us this blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Levi Hartle, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your journey of faith. It's uh, just beautiful to see the way that the Lord has worked in your life. And be assured of our prayers and many blessings on your priestly ministry and all the people that God has entrusted to you, your thousands of children and the communities that you're building up. Thank you for your beautiful work in the church. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Be blessed. <laughs> 